What's up motivators, Taryn here. If you are thinking about entering your first half marathon, but maybe you're starting from absolutely no running whatsoever, stick around because today we are going to get you to run your first half marathon. We're gonna talk about gear, the technique that you need, how to build up your running ability so that you can train for a half marathon how long it'll take, the training zones you'll need, give you a training plan, and then talk about the nutrition. We're also going to talk about this 80-20 rule about all of your training. If you're listening to this in podcast form and you want some of the visuals, go over to the Terran's Motive Method YouTube channel. If you are watching this and you want to listen to this, you won't miss anything by going over to the Terran's Motive Method podcast. With all of that said, let's get into it. My name is Taryn Gazelle. In my late 20s, I was overweight, unfulfilled, and couldn't even run to the end of the block. Over the following 10 years, I lost 65 pounds racing triathlons, running races, cycling events, and world championships. But eventually, the suffer culture of endurance sports training caught up to me causing health issues and injuries. Now, my company Motive and I are on a mission to help people live more fulfilling lives by reaching endurance sports goals using healthy methods. We can all kill it on race day without killing our bodies. Let's do it. Before we get into anything, I want to impart that no matter where you are starting, no matter how hard you think that running your first half marathon can be, you can definitely do it. I myself started from literally not being able to run more than the length of one house, 50 feet at a time is how much I started with. And if I can go from that to being able to run a 128 half marathon, placing in the top 20 of, I think it was 2000 athletes and running a 134 half marathon in a half Ironman race, going from not being able to run 50 feet to being able to put out those times with somebody who's I'm not built for running, I'm thick, I'm stocky, I have a 30 inch inseam, I'm built more for caber tossing than anything, but if I can learn how to run and put out those sorts of times, you can definitely finish a race. So let's dive into how you can actually do that. The first thing I wanna talk about is gear. Now, typically, I don't think that gear is anything that should hold you back from starting a fitness journey. If you're just looking at starting and getting out, use whatever shoes, use whatever watch, use whatever clothes you have. Go and just do things. You'll gradually learn what all the things are that you want to purchase. But if you are specifically saying, I want to train for a half marathon, you are going to have to do a fair bit of training. I think that you will be better off by doing a certain type of training with the zones and following a training plan. And in saying that, I believe that there is some gear that is going to make life a lot easier for you. So let's share with you what that gear is. So there are two pieces of gear that I think are really critical for you to start with if you are getting into an official training plan. The first one being a good set of running shoes. And when you're just starting out, if you're in the buildup stage of literally just learning to run, seeing if you can run, use whatever shoes you want. But once you get into an official training plan, I would very much recommend you get some shoes. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, go to a running store and get fitted for shoes. I'd be very cautious of this because quite often when you go into a running store, they're going to assess your gait, you're gonna walk back and forth, maybe run on a treadmill, and they're going to then say, you need stability shoes, you need overpronation shoes, underpronation shoes. When really beginner runners, the data support, the studies all show that when you are just learning how to run, you should be in a very neutral shoe so that your body can function the way that it normally does without being limited. So I'm going to show you the parameters that I would look for, and I've got no affiliation with Running Warehouse, but this is the type of shoe that I would search for if I were you. So the filters that I would go for is, I don't really care about brand necessarily. What I do care about is the stability level. I would just go with something neutral, again, so that your body can just function in its normal biomechanics. Weight-wise, when a shoe is too heavy or too light, you're going to either not have enough cushioning or you're gonna to have too much cushioning and again, not function the way that your body really wants to. The sweet spot tends to be around seven to 10 ounces. So a neutral seven to 10 ounce shoe. 
and then the heel to toe offset. That's the drop between the heel and the toe. Again, what studies show is that zero to six millimeters seems to be about the sweet spot for most new runners. So you're getting a very, very neutral shoe and we've got upwards of 200 shoes to choose from here. Anything in here I would really recommend. I might caution you against these really built up shoes because that is going to prevent you from running in your natural biomechanics, but something that is just moderately nicely cushioned in the zero to six millimeter heel to toe drop in the seven to 10 ounces and in the neutral shoe category. The other thing that I would recommend that you get is a running watch with a chest strap based heart rate monitor. You can get things like the Garmin 945 LTE. It's what I use for running, which has a wrist based heart rate monitor, but when you start jostling around a lot, it tends not to have very accurate heart rate data. A chest-based heart rate monitor is gonna be extremely accurate. And as we're gonna talk about later on in this video and podcast, it's really critical to make sure that you are training a lot at a low intensity. And one of the best ways to make sure that you are training at that low intensity is by making sure that your heart rate is nice and low. If you're wondering what watch to get, I would go to the DC Rainmaker website where he does reviews of all different kinds of watches. I would go to his buyer's guide and then just go to the best GPS watches. Take a look and that's going to be one of the best starting points for you. The next thing we've got to discuss is running technique. I put this very high up in the priority of what you need to learn to do a half marathon because a half marathon is long. For most people, it's going to take roughly around two hours. That's a lot of pounding when you think that every single foot strike is putting about seven to eight times your body weight up through your body. That is a lot of force that your body has to absorb. If you have the right technique, it's going to make you faster. It's going to make you less likely to get injured. You're going to enjoy the process a lot more because you're going to have a lot less banged up nicks and niggles and aches and pains. If you can just run smoothly, effortlessly, then we can get into just building up and getting the right training zones and the training plan execution is going to be much easier. So let's talk about the technique that you can develop that will make running a lot more enjoyable for you. So when it comes to running technique, there's going to be a couple of things that you're going to have to be aware of. A lot of run coaches are going very much towards natural running where you're landing on your forefoot or your toes. And what they're saying is if you were to run barefoot down the street, you would definitely run on your forefoot or your toes. But the fact of the matter is that you aren't running barefoot. I would really caution you against that. It is like one of the number one ways to get injured and not actually be able to run. And I know there are obvious exceptions of people that run barefoot, but uh, yeah, it tends to just increase the likelihood of injury. So put on those shoes and once you've got the shoes, it tends to be fairly natural for people to land on their heel. What we want you to stop doing is landing out in front of your center of gravity. When you land out in front of your center of mass and in front of your body, that seven to eight times your body weight kind of shock goes up your body and it has to be absorbed by all your musculoskeletal system. The way that you can avoid this and make the run much more smooth and less injury prone is by landing under your center of gravity. So whether you're landing on your heel, your forefoot, your midfoot, you can land anywhere on your foot as long as you're landing and placing the bulk of your weight underneath your body and not out in front of you. There's a really easy way to learn how to do this and it's just by jumping up and down in place when you're about to start your run, you're going to notice that you will land directly under your center of mass and then start some butt kicks and then just start gradually leaning forward from the ankles, not the hips. When you do this, you're going to feel good running form. And when you start running, stop every three to four minutes and repeat this drill. This is going to teach your body how to run with that good form. As simple as that, that is all the running technique that you are really going to have to learn when you're just starting out. That's going to make training a lot more enjoyable because you're going to be a lot less beat up. I will caution you that for the first three to four weeks of doing this, it places a lot of load on your calves, so your calves might be a fair bit beat up, but they will learn, especially if you've got really good running shoes. 
Just wanna take a brief pause here to thank our first sponsor. I am literally making up my morning shake here with the Athletic Greens. You can see it there right at the top. This is a product that I use every single morning. This is AG1 by Athletic Greens. And the reason that I started using it is because it's a really good replacement for multivitamins. Multivitamins, as you might know by looking into the toilet and seeing lime green pea, you're essentially just making your pee really expensive because you're not absorbing any of the nutrients from those multivitamins in pill form. Now, AG1 is a whole food greens powder that is really easy for your body to actually assimilate because it's made with whole foods, has 75 vitamins, minerals, nutrients, good for digestive health. So I use this every single day. You can check this out if you want. Athletic Greens has made it easy for you with your first purchase of Athletic Greens at athleticgreens.com forward slash Taryn, you will get a free year's supply of vitamin D and five free travel packages. Again, athleticgreens.com forward slash Taryn to take ownership of your daily nutritional needs. I'm gonna blend this sucker up now. The third thing we're going to talk about is building up. How do you get ready to be able to train? Well, this is where the concept of you have to train to be ready to train. What I think people should do is train themselves to be ready to accept a training plan. Just starting from absolutely zero is really hard if you get thrown into a training plan right away. It's also really intimidating because you think, holy smokes, am I even capable of following a training plan? That's where I think building up and training to be able to train comes into play. So for most people, where I recommend they start a half marathon training plan is being able to run at least 30 minutes continuously without stopping. For a lot of people who are watching or listening to this, that's gonna be really intimidating. So let me give you a building up training plan that is going to get you to that 30 minute mark right now. Okay, so what I've laid out here is a basic week. Training weeks start Monday and end Sunday. For people who are just looking at getting started, we are looking at running three times per week with three run workouts, run walk workouts, and you'll see what we mean, that's going to be enough to be able to teach your body how to run really, really well without being tremendously challenging. If you're listening to this in podcast form, you should be able to understand this without seeing it really easily. So let me explain. What we're going to start with is the long workout. The long workout can come on either Saturday or Sunday. It's going to be on the weekend and we like to do long workouts on the weekend because that's when people tend to have the most time. So for this long workout being either Saturday or Sunday, I don't really care, take your pick. This is going to be anywhere from 30 upwards to about 50 minutes. Now you might be thinking, holy smokes, running for 30 to 50 minutes? There's absolutely no way I can do this. Aren't we just building up to being able to run 30 minutes? Yes. The reason that we are doing this as 30 to 50 minutes is because it's not a run. What we're looking to do with this weekend workout is we want to build mitochondria in your body. Mitochondria are the energy producers of your muscles. How you build mitochondria is by going at a low heart rate effort for a long period of time. So what we're going to do with this 30 to 50 minutes is we're going to start with about 30 to 50 minutes and usually about six weeks is enough time for people to build up. But if you need to take just four weeks, depending on where you're starting, or maybe eight weeks or 10 weeks, you're gonna follow the same principle. So we're gonna start with about 30 minutes and we're gonna build our way up to 50 minutes by the end, depending on how long you want to take. And what this is going to be is it's not a run, it is a hard hike. When we get to our training zone period, we're gonna talk about how hard the hard should be, but generally this is going to be in your low intensity, in your zone one or your zone two. Keeping it a hard hike is going to make it still very engaging, but it's gonna keep that heart rate really nice and low. That's going to allow you to learn how to be on your feet and still stay upright 
which is going to be very challenging. I went for a hard hike that was 90 minutes on the weekend, and the very next day, my body is sore. I felt like I did a really solid workout. Hiking is really nothing to sneeze at because you are still holding your body weight upright. You're also spending more time on the ground with every single foot strike than you are with running. So it's almost giving your body more load than running. What we're looking to do is just spend time in that low heart rate while keeping our body upright and learning how to withstand that pounding. So start with a 30 minute hard hike in that low intensity zone one or two kind of heart rate and gradually build up week by week where you start with 30 minutes and then go to 35 and then go to 40 and then to 45 and then to 50. And then when you get to 50 minutes in the hike, then I want you to hold that and then start doing longer and longer periods of running at the end. So once you got to 50 minutes, maybe elsewhere in the week, you're able to run continuously for four minutes. So at the end of this hike, do a couple of four minute efforts, maybe a six minute effort. I want you to, at the end of this workout, once you get to 50 minutes, just stay at 50 minutes, but then have a longer and longer period at the end of the workout where you are running continuously. So that is your endurance building workout of the week. The next workout of the week, we want to space a little bit away from that weekend. So if you did that hike on Saturday, then you could do this on Monday. If you did it on Sunday, then you could do it on Tuesday. You want a day of rest in between, especially when you're first starting out. So let's say you did this on Sunday. We're going to have a Tuesday fast workout. So this is going to be for your speed. And you might think, well, hey, why do I need speed? I'm literally just learning how to run. In my experience, what I find happens to adults is we move around really slow. We sit a lot. We don't tend to move quickly. So our fast twitch muscle fibers, our neuromuscular connection between our brain and our muscles kind of goes to sleep. So it becomes hard to turn over really quickly. That's where you end up having a lot of endurance athletes that really just slowly slog through every single run and ride and swim because neuromuscularly we just can't turn over very quickly. We're going to change that with this Tuesday workout and this is something that almost no learn to run program actually includes. I think it just develops very slow athletes who yeah can complete races but they're never really happy with those races. We want you to be able to complete the races and complete them well. So what we're going to do with this Tuesday workout is this is only going to be about 20 to 30 minutes and it's going to stay 20 to 30 minutes all the way until the end. But what I want you to do in this speed workout is do wind sprints, quick wind sprints of starting with say 10 seconds and ending with 60 seconds. And you might say, okay, well, wind sprints, like how fast are we doing the wind sprints? What zone are we talking about with the wind sprints? Don't worry about zones at all. Go to a football field, a soccer field, a track, something like that. Time out on your watch 10 seconds or 60 seconds and just go fast. How fast is fast? really fast, really very nice and fast. So that means your 10 second sprint is going to be like Usain Bolt kind of fast. Your 60 second sprint, a little bit slower. As you're doing this, just take as much rest as you need to feel fully recovered. So you might at the start do a 10 second sprint and then three minutes of walking around, of light jogging, of really just catching your breath so that every time you hit that 10 second effort that you are going to run, it's going to be forceful, fast, really intense. So the rest can be anywhere from two up to, let's call it, four minutes. Ideally, I want you to do somewhere between about eight and 10 sprints, be it the 10 to 60 seconds. 
as you continue on, you're gonna build from 10 seconds to 15 seconds to 20 seconds to 25 seconds to 30 seconds all the way up to 60 seconds as you feel comfortable. This is going to teach your body to neuromuscularly fire really quickly. It's going to teach it how to turn over really quickly and recruit a whole bunch of new muscle groups that maybe you aren't currently recruiting. So we're pairing being able to go long on the weekend with being able to go fast and fire with really good form. Then we get into what you might expect because this is what most learn to run programs have. This is on Thursday or a day away from your weekend workout and a day away from the fast workout. This is what you would normally expect, your walk, run, workout. And this is very straightforward. This is going to be a one minute run followed by a four minute walk. Then every single week, I want you to increase the run by 30 seconds and decrease the walk by 30 seconds. So the next week we're gonna do one and a half minutes run and then three and a half minutes walk all the way down until we get to the point where you're doing about three and a half minutes to four minutes of running continuously and only about 90 seconds of walking. Once you get there, oh, and this workout is only going to be again about 20 to 30 minutes. So what you're going to experience is with the weekend run, you're going to be able to stay upright and have your heart rate pumping for 30 to 50 minutes with some running at the end. With the Tuesday workout, you're going to be able to teach your body how to fire really quickly and recruit a bunch of muscle groups. And then with your Thursday workout, you're going to learn how to just continuously run for a long period of time. Put all of this together and at the end of it, I guarantee that if you walked up to a 5K race that you would be able to get this done in 30 to 40 minutes with continuous running and that is how you are going to build up your ability to run. The second sponsor we have to thank today is our pals over at Zwift. When we moved over to the west coast of Canada, one of the first things that I set up, even though I can bike outside year round, is a Zwift setup. And the reason that I've done that is because it's a really, really efficient way to get in an excellent workout. Whether you've got one of the workouts from our Motive Training app that is uploaded to Zwift, where all you have to do is just set it in erg mode and just pedal away and all of the intervals and the resistance level is done for you, or you wanna get on and just not have to deal with hills and wind and stoplights that you have to deal with out in the real world, Zwift is one of the most efficient ways to get in a really good workout in a time crunch scenario. Now, if you aren't on Zwift, you can go and try it out. Go to Zwift.com and then you can sign up, try it for free for a little while. Or if you're already on Zwift and you wanna find a community of people to ride with, definitely try some of the races or join our Motive group training ride that is held Thursday mornings and we're gonna be opening up more over the rest of the year for people all around the world in different time zones. So Zwift.com, check it out. Ride on, motivators. The next thing we're going to talk about is how long will it take to train for a half marathon? How many hours per week and how many weeks is it going to take you? This depends entirely on your current level of fitness and your goals. If you want to be an elite athlete, it's going to take you a few years. If you just want to limp across the finish line, it's not really going to take you that long. If you already are an elite athlete, you're going to be able to race really quickly. But if you are just starting out where most people probably are, it's gonna take you a little bit longer. To make the answer easier of how long does it take to train for a half marathon, we created a calculator that you can use. There's a link in the description below, but let's show you what that calculator actually so is. So this is the how much to train calculator that we've created for any endurance race that you can really think of. The link to it is in the description below. And what we've set up here is the ability for you to come in and select the race that you wanna do. So we're going to select running and we're going to select a half marathon and then input what your background is. Whether you have no background, a modest background or an elite background, no background means you have really no fitness background. You're starting from scratch. A modest background means that you are fit, you are currently exercising, 
but it's in an unrelated sport like jujitsu or MMA or curling, who would ever do that? Or you have an elite background. This is already really competitive in an endurance sport. Most people watching this video are going to be in the no background category. It also allows you to then select your race goal. For most people just starting out, I would recommend starting with finish. The first race is never gonna be very pleasant, and if you start adding a whole bunch of training that you maybe aren't ready to actually accept by adding in finish strong or compete, your body might not actually even be able to absorb it, so you could be doing more training than your body can handle, and you might not even benefit from it. I would start off small and gradually increase because less is more at this point. So let's say that these are your inputs. You hit submit and it's going to say that approximately six months of good training, three to five hours a week is going to get you to be able to finish that half marathon. Easy, done, right? Well, in a couple of sections, we're going to explain how to set up that training every single week. The next thing we're going to talk about is training zones. This is where we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how do you actually train. And this is where we show you this 80-20 chart. If there is one thing that I can impart to every single endurance athlete, it is this one chart. The concept that we're getting at is the 80-20 method of training where 80% of your training is low intensity and 20% of your training is high intensity. Now, specifically, it doesn't have to be this exact amount like a lot of books and training methods might lead you to believe. It's very unpractical because to spend 20% at a really high intensity heart rate, well, you've got to get your heart rate up from that low intensity to the high intensity. So you're going to spend a fair bit of time in a moderate intensity. What this also leaves out is that moderate intensity. Like when you are running a half marathon, you're running not in the low intensity 80% not in the high intensity 20%, you're going to be more in a moderate sustainable intensity. And if all you do is train at low intensity for 80% of the time and high intensity for 20% of the time, you almost don't know how to pace your race. You don't have the physiology to be able to hold that moderate intensity for a long period of time. So generally, I am not a big believer in the 80-20 method of running or triathlon training. It oversimplifies what is actually needed. What is needed is the vast majority of your training is at a low intensity. We're talking somewhere between about 70 and 80%. Now, the other percentage of 20 to 30% will be comprised of that moderate intensity training that is going to make you comfortable with your race pace and really high intensity training. But this chart of 80-20 is a really nice way just to say, do the vast majority of your training at a low intensity. What is low and high intensity training? That's where we're gonna go over and I'm gonna show you another calculator where you can calculate your training zones. So this is a heart rate zone calculator that again, there is a link in the description below so you can use this for free. Just go to our website and you put in your information. We like the Carvinen method of getting heart rate zones. A lot of the other coaches and methods of getting heart rate zones out there are maybe a percentage of your 220 minus your age and then a percentage of that. Or maybe if it's more sophisticated, you do a max heart rate test and then you get some percentages based off of that. Or maybe there are some yes, no questions and you get your heart rate zones based off of that. None of these are really relevant to you. We like the Carvinen method because it is relevant to your exact physiology. And we have thousands of people on our training app and more often than not, they find that the Carvinen method is much more customized to them. There are many fewer instances of going like, these zones really don't seem right because it's based on your exact physiology. What you take is your maximum heart rate. And if you've never done a maximum heart rate test, I'll give it to you right now. You do a two mile easy run warm up, a one mile tempo, so like fast, comfortable, bringing your heart rate up, tempo run. Then you do 400 meters at your max effort. 
and then another 400 meters where every 100 meters you are pushing a little bit harder. You're probably not gonna go any faster, but it's gonna jack your heart rate up that couple of extra beats. Take that maximum heart rate and then give yourself the benefit of the doubt and assume that if there was a gun to your head, you'd probably be able to crank out another couple of beats. So in my case, what I see on the heart rate is 183 when I do this test, but I give myself the benefit of the doubt and I say 185. And then what you do to get your resting heart rate is sleep with your watch, which ideally has an optical heart rate sensor on it. Take your lowest overnight resting heart rate that you see in that those sleeps over about a three day period. So in my case, tends to be around 49. And what this calculates is the difference between your resting heart rate and your maximum heart rate and then some percentages based on that. So it actually does create some zones that in my experience are very, very similar to getting into a lab. I've gone in and done lab testing and it basically gets to identical numbers. We've tried this with a few other people who have done lab testing, same sort of thing, almost identical numbers. So then you use these zones that you'll get. Zone one is your active recovery zone. Zone two, this is where you're going to spend a lot of time running. This is in between all of your intervals, all of your tempo intervals. This is where you're going to do your long run in zone two. This is where you do your long hikes. This is the 80% of the low intensity train that we're gonna talk about in a couple more sections. Zone three, this is going to be your moderate intensity. The high end of this is probably where you're going to race your half marathon. Zone four, the low end of this might be where you're racing your half marathon, but it could also be where you're doing a lot of your tempo runs and your speed work. And zone five, top end speed, this might be where you do two to four minute intervals. The second to last thing that I wanna talk about is the training plan. Now that we've got the gear, the technique, you've built up to be able to accept the training. You know roughly how long it's going to take and you know the training zones that you need to spend a lot of time at. Let's give you an exact training plan that you can use to build up for a half marathon. So this is the Motive Training app where you'd go into your account, go on my training plan, and let's add a race. So let's go ahead and add a race. Let's do it four months out, and it is going to be a half marathon. Then what's presented to you is a week that we would recommend. This is a breakdown of a week that we would recommend based on what is going to result in a good amount of rest while being able to hit some key workouts. But you can always go and change the workouts on these days but you can go back and forth and see, well, I only wanna do a certain amount of training. Well, the words underneath are going to actually change. So as you go back and forth, you might be heading for the podium, you might be finishing feeling strong, but let's go for that just cross the finish line, just that nice beginner plan. How that looks is we have a Tuesday intense run of 40 to 80 minutes, a Thursday steady tempo run of 50 to 120 minutes, and then a Sunday long run of 50 to 120 minutes. Let me show you what that training plan actually looks like in practice. So now let's give you the training plan for that half marathon. As we lined out on Sunday, we are going to do a long run, and this is going to be in the neighborhood of 50 to 120 minutes. Then on Thursday, we have a steady run, which if you know running lingo, we're talking about a tempo run. And again, this is also 50 to 120 minutes. On Tuesday, we have the intense run, and this is 40 to 80 minutes. Now remember when I said that it's gonna take about six months of good training to be able to prepare for this? That six months includes the build up, the learn to run training program that we're gonna assume is somewhere around six to eight weeks. So let's call this training plan four months. During this training plan, what we're also going to do is we are going to do one, two, three weeks that are going to be work. This is where you are going to actually push it a little bit. You're gonna challenge yourself a little bit. Then every fourth week is going to be a rest week. 
And what is a rest week? It's a drop down to about 60% of what you did the week prior. So let's say you built up to 100 minutes here, you're going to drop it down to about 60 minutes. If you had built up to eight intervals in the intense run, you are going to drop it down to four or five intervals and even make those intervals a little bit shorter. We wanna follow that pattern of three weeks of working, one week of rest, all the way to the end of the four months. We are also going to add down here at the bottom, this is going to be a rest week. In the very final week leading up to your race, we want to drop the training time of each workout down by about 50%, but keep some intensity in. I'd also want you to start that week with a complete day off. That's gonna help eliminate some of the fatigue. So in this week, we are still going to train, but we're just gonna have tiny little pops of intensity of about two to three minutes. But let's get into what you're wondering for the exact plan. So we're following this three weeks on, one week off. We are leaving a week at the end for resting. In these four months, what I want you to do for all of these workouts is the intense runs are going to focus on two to six minute intervals. The steady runs, these are more tempo-based runs. These are going to focus on intervals of roughly eight to 25 minutes long. In the long run, this is going to be just an easy zone two effort. So it's going to be continuous and you're just going to start at 50 minutes, gradually build your way up week by week up to an hour and 20 minutes. And then if you get to that hour and 20 minutes and you still have weeks left, just stay at the hour and 20 minutes. So this hour and 20, that's gonna be plenty of endurance. Even if you haven't done the distance, don't worry, you're going to be able to do the distance of the race. That's going to get you that nice mitochondria density, that endurance benefit, the ability to burn fat as fuel. You're gonna be able to test your nutrition, which we'll talk about in the next section in this workout. Everything's gonna be just fine building up to that 120 minutes. This intense run, why we have this intense run focused in two to six minutes is that's the sweet spot for improving your VO2 max. Basically in this long run, we're building up mitochondrial density, the energy producers of our muscles. In this intense run, we are teaching that mitochondria how to fire and function a little bit better. These two to six minute intervals, we are going to do them on somewhere around a one to one or a three to one or a four to one work to rest ratio. So these are going to be fairly difficult. You want to do 40 to 80 minutes of these two to six minute intervals. So start with a 10 to 20 minute warm up with some dynamic drills and just loosening up and feeling good in that first 20 minutes. And then for the remainder of the run, do a number of two to six minute intervals, as many as you can do and fit in in the time on a one-to-one, -one, like a two minutes of work, two minutes of rest. That's gonna allow you to come back and recover the very next day because you didn't go too deep into the well. These steady runs, this is the tempo effort. This is being able to go fast for a long period of time. This is where we bridge the gap between the long run and the intense run. This is that moderate training zone, more around race effort. So for this, we want to do longer intervals, starting at around eight minutes and build our way down until we are doing 25 minute continuous intervals. How hard is this? Well, this is roughly at or a little bit above your race effort. What is your race effort? Well, that's a little bit for you to figure out, but we can put a link in the description below to a calculator that we've got for putting in a recent run time that you've done, and then you get all of your paces. So that's a basic training plan of what will get you ready for a half marathon. The final thing we're going to talk about is nutrition. Generally, for a workout or a race of 75 minutes or less, you don't have to take any nutrition in the form of calories in that race because if you've eaten beforehand, which everyone should, you are going to have enough stored energy in your blood and in your muscles to be able to get through a 75 minute effort really easily. But 
for the vast majority of us, I would say probably just about everyone watching this or listening to this, their race is going to be longer than 75 minutes, so nutrition is an important thing. Let's go over to another calculator that we've created on our website, and there's a link in the description below for it, where you can enter your individual setup and structure with your weight and how fast you think you're going to go in the race, and we're going to tell you how to use that to actually create your own nutrition plan to get the most out of your race day and your training. So this is another calculator that is linked in the description below. It's on our website, it's free to use. You can go here and you can type in any endurance sport you want. I actually created this calculator originally for a marathon swim that I was doing, but then we repurposed it and used the same logic for triathlon training. It can be done for cycling events. You can do it for running events. The same math and logic that was created in this book, The Performance Zone, Your Nutrition Action Plan for Greater Endurance Sports Performance by John Ivey, it's all what went into this calculator. So let's create a running plan. And right now I'm about 175 pounds and the distance of a half marathon is 13.1 miles. I would probably finish a half marathon right now in an hour and 35 minutes. I'll hit submit and you are going to then get a guideline of how many calories you're going to burn based on your weight and how fast you're going and then a guideline of how many calories do you consume. Don't worry about the decimals here, we're going to take those decimals out and round this calculator by the time you get to it I'm sure. But you want to replace this amount of calories which is 25% of the calories that you burn. Why 25%? Because it's enough that your body is not running out of energy but it's not so much that your gut is going to have a hard time absorbing it. So this target here, you want to consume that amount of calories during your race and before the race. So let me explain. Starting 20 minutes before your race, take a serving of calories. If you're having a gel, which is what I would recommend for running races, I would steer clear of solid foods, stick to gels. It's been proven to work a lot better for running races. You have one serving of those gels before your race. Then in even intervals, every 20 to 30 minutes or so, have another serving. So that means that about 20 minutes into your race, you're gonna have a serving. Then maybe at 50 minutes into your race, you're gonna have a serving. An hour and 20 minutes into your race, you're gonna have a serving. Evenly break it up so that you're getting enough nutrition throughout the entire course of the race. Also, when you're passing any aid station, just take a small sip of whatever fluids or electrolyte waters they might have. The way that you would actually take that is take the cup and crush it and then just get a little spout and just suck that out of the corner. In training, any workout that's 75 minutes or less, just take fluid. If it's 75 minutes or more, you can take fluid and some calories and this is going to train your gut to be able to take on calories while you're exercising. Now you have the training, you've got the nutrition, you're gonna be ahead of probably 98% of the field. Even some of the elite people don't go to the effort of figuring out how many calories they should be replacing. This is going to really, really set you up well to have your best race. So there we go motivators, I hope that you found this helpful in getting you to your first half marathon. I guarantee that if you follow these methods that you will be able to reach that finish line and get to your first half marathon. It's exhilarating to do. It's a big challenge, a big goal, and I know that you can all do it. If you found this helpful and you want just a little more advice, you want things a little more customized to you, you want to be able to move workouts around on certain days, you want to maybe see what happens if you train a little bit more or get some guidance on exactly what heart rates to hit or what times you should actually not be thinking about heart rate and when you should be thinking about pace and then what paces to hit and you want guidelines on nutrition, all of that you can try out in our training app that you can get to. There's a link in the description below. You you can reach it at mymotive.com. You can try it for free for 14 days where we have all endurance training plans for half marathons, marathons, triathlons, duathlons. All you have to do is put in the amount of time that you want to train and your race dates and plans are created and coordinated
coordinated together for you so that you are never overtrained or undertrained for any race that you can show up on race day and have your best experience. In our opinion, it's as good as a one-on-one -on -one coach with the same price as basically doing it yourself. So link in the description below to that. Thank you for watching or listening. Later, motivators.